Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining our series 2021 Health and Wellness Will Be Different. Last session, we discussed about the fast growing elderly group, or we call it New Life Builders. This week, we will deep dive into the health and immunity for this group and how we can protect them to make sure that they have enough nutrition. We are so honored to have our two experts from DSM, a science-based company specializing in nutrition, health, and sustainable living. Before diving in today, I would like to encourage you to think about these four questions while listening to our discussion and presentation. Next slide, please. And um, these four questions is, what excites you? What concerns you? What would you like to know more about? And lastly, what ideas come to you while listening to our discussion? And please feel free to share your thoughts and ideas in our chat box. At the end of the session, our speakers and moderators will give, us, uh, will give you answers. Um, let me introduce you to our speakers and moderator of the day. First, Alaksya Topcha. Alaksya is a medical marketing professional with 15 years of diverse experience in pharmaceutical industry. Her professional journey started as a medical representative in consumer care products, moving towards product manage management roles in Novartis and medical DNP on regional level. Since 2017, she joined DSM and she is currently a global manager for medical nutrition and pharma segment at DSM. Her professional focus is innovation for novel patient solutions with vitamin, lipids, and other nutraceuticals. We are so glad to have you here with us today. Secondly, let me introduce you to Taiji Inui. Taiji is APAC Regional Manager for Nutrition Science and Advocacy at DSM Nutritional Products. Taiji's professional focus is on scientific disciplines around health and aging, including nutrition, preventive medicine, mastication, and oral health with a PhD in pharmacognosy or natural product chemistry from University of Illinois. With over 10 years in industrial experience. Thank you so much, Taiji, for joining us today. And joining our sessions, by our two moderators from the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy. Dave McCocken, our senior consultant and trainer here at Consumer Healthcare Training Academy. Dave is a fantastic storyteller with over 30 years in marketing advertising, mostly in strategy planning and market research. With his passion in people observation, how people react to things around them. In consumer healthcare is no different his passion is how the change of health and wellness affect people and their lifestyle and how it affects businesses around the world. He's also expert in inside development. If you want to know more about Dev, you can search Dev McCocken on Google or YouTube, you won't miss him. He's all over YouTube. And last but not least, let me introduce you to Steve Salby, our co-founder of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy and the founder of Exponential. Steve has a strong background in consumer healthcare in different cultures. He was a senior executive for Record Bank user in 3M Healthcare with his belief that people is the most important resource in the organization. Over 15 years, he was invited to speak and train companies around the world in both healthcare and non-healthcare industries. He also strongly believes that good patient is a patient who is informed, inspired, and empowered. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome our speakers and moderators for today, Alaksya, Taiji, Dev, and Steve. Thank you so much, Aim, Alaksya and Taiji. It's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Um, this is a, a topic which is really close to my heart as Aim was saying that I really believe that the best medicine that we can help create is actually 
the patient themselves who is informed about their condition and what they need to do that is um, empowered with, of course, ideas, products, uh, different tips and techniques, but most importantly, that is inspired to actually change behaviors and change lifestyle to improve their health and wellness. And I think nutrition is probably one of the most powerful of the different elements that we can empower our consumers with to help them with their health and wellness. So it's, it's really, uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to basically be part of this today. So thank you. Dave, great to see you again, mate. Yeah, this is fantastic. I'm really excited about uh, this session. Um, as people that have watched our previous sessions know, I'm really passionate about the aging population and the way in which companies and marketers should be thinking about it. I think it's also really timely. Um, you probably a lot of the people watching this won't be aware, but last week there was a global conference called the Global Wellness Summit, um, which is an annual event around health and wellness. And one of the subjects there was about nutrition. It was a, it was a big subject. And I'm just seeing a lot more in the, we're not just obviously in the obvious uh, discussions around, you know, what you should eat and stuff, but, and diet and cooking, but actually real interest in the way in which nutrition can change aging populations, lifestyles, uh, yeah. their future, etc. And I think this is going to be great. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Araksha, it's so lovely to, to see you again. Uh, it's been three years and uh, really I was very inspired by a presentation that you gave at the Nicholas Hall conference uh, around three years ago, where I thought, this is the way we need to start thinking. So how's it been since those last three years? How's, uh, has it been as exciting as, as we thought it was going to be as people are adopting this? Yeah, absolutely, Steve. As you know, uh, the Nicholas Hall presentations, they had a great feedback and really happy it led to indeed innovation and currently the products on the shelf, basically. Ah. And that um, together with our consumer healthcare industry partners. Yeah. Exciting it is when, when you go, especially as I came from pure pharma into the nutrition, then you become a real fan of this. You, yeah. That's an amazing field to work for and the purpose is indeed great. Exactly. And it is absolutely a purpose. Brilliant. Thank you. And Tai Chi, uh, very, very good to have you on board. Uh, it was really one of those things I think is very exciting is the relationship between medicine and, and nutrition. And I think this is something that we've only just scratched the surface. The two elements have always been far apart. So I'm really looking forward to hearing some great insights uh, from both of you in terms of how we can bring this closer so that nutrition becomes really part of the therapy and part of the inspiration for many many people so really really great okay well thank you steve and everyone for for this uh, an opportunity it's a pleasure to be here um well when we talk about aging and immune health we all know it's a very big topic and i think you know steve sort of you alluded me that there is a link between medicine and food and nutrition how all, all those things for well, i guess for medicine most of it we put in our mouth but there is a such disparity and, and therefore it's a huge topic. So in a limited amount of time, I will attempt to, to give you enough flavor on this through nutrients and then how elder population are vulnerable and then not only because of the um, immunosenescence, but also the insufficiency um, of the nutrient intake with focus on the Asia Pacific region. Okay, this atlas that you might have seen in somewhere else, but it's a color-coded map showing that the, the proportion of the population being an elderly, in this case, age above 60. On the left-hand side, you see the data from 2014, and while you see some uh, darker orange, reddish colors in North America, Europe, Oceania, and in Japan, and actually, the Japan was the only country that has a population age above 60, 30% um, or more of its population at that point. Fast forward 2050, on the right-hand side, 
we see a darker edge in, in majority of the European countries, China, Canada, and Thailand. And then the rest of the, the, the regions are also in a reddish color. So we see a clear shift of the aging population um, all over the world. But when you see it focusing on the, the Asia, where it used to be green in you know, Indonesia and Malaysia and the Philippines, have a clear shift in getting towards of the, the warmer colors. This, however, it's not all good news because um, there is a gap between the overall life expectancy and a life expectancy um, during which you are spending in a healthy life. So this figure shows the gap between the overall life expectancy, which is on the, the tip of the right-hand side of this horizontal bar chart. However, the darker blue shows the ages that you are expected to spend healthily um, based on the statistics for those countries. And in other edge, there is 8.7 years gap between the total life expectancy and a healthy life expectancy. So those years that you are bedridden or have some sort of uh, disabilities and health um, ailments. One of the health aspects that impacts elderly more so than the younger counterpart is around immune health. For, for which awareness, I think it's significantly elevated this year due to the pandemic that we are experiencing. Elderly suffer more often from a severe symptoms if they catch a respiratory viral infection like influenza. And the presence of comorbidities increases susceptibility and increase in the likelihood to require a nutritional intervention. Now, two main points relevant uh, with impaired immune functions among the elderly is nutritional deficiency and an immunosenescence. And here that the, the diet and then micronutrients and the nutritional status are really the key in supporting the immune system. And another thing that it's worthwhile mentioning as a clear difference between medicine and then the nutrition is that there is not a single food or nutritional supplement that will prevent a person from getting a viral infection. And then mostly because it's partially about exposure, but it's also about combating against a specific pathogen is the role of the, the medicine. Whereas the role of uh, nutrition is to help support the body function to its optimal level. So it's not necessarily a targeted approach that how nutrition support health. Now, this slide um, sort of summarizes what are the key nutrients for optimal immune functions. And when I say this, I sometimes so, sort of makes me think because if I may be a generalist, every single nutrient is important for your health. However, there are certain subsets of nutrients, both macro and micronutrients that has more relevance to a specific health element, in this case, immune functions. And then these are proteins, B vitamins, vitamin D, C, zinc, and omega-3. Why these nutrients are called out specifically uh, are listed here, and I'm not going to read it through, but basically, if you think about immune functions, it requires certain immune cells and um, cascaded systems of signals. And then we need to have a substance and a building blocks to um, synthesize and proliferate those cells as well as signals. And proteins, B vitamins, as well as these micronutrients listed here, all play a very critical role in maintaining those functions at the optimal level. Now, in order to, to sort of bring this topic a bit more relevance to what we want to, to discuss without elaborating too much detail of individual micronutrients, um, I'm presenting this slide as a summary of 
evidence-based recommendation by experts um, with regards to immune functions and nutrition uh, with some focus on elderly. So first and foremost, the micronutrients all play an important role in maintaining health. And then therefore the expert recommendation is daily multivitamin and mineral supplementation on top of the healthy and well-balanced diet. For some of the micronutrients that was listed before, like vitamin C and vitamin D, um, expert recommendation highlights a higher intake level than RDA. So for vitamin C, while in many countries RDA is 100 milligram, the expert recommendation goes to 200 and 500 milligram for healthy populations, and then one to two gram um, for individuals with increased requirements, which also applies to elderly. The vitamin D requirements varies um, between 10 to 20 microgram, depending on which country you're in or the, your ages, but the expert recommendation also surpasses that um, to be uh, 50 microgram per day. These uh, are based on the insights related to the micronutrient status, as well as micronutrient intake of, of those vitamins. And some of you uh, may be aware that the recommended daily intake levels are set to a certain criteria. So in the past, vitamin C level was set to prevent scurvy. These days, many countries set the vitamin, D, vitamin C status in order to maintain a um, saturation for the lymphocyte level or the homeostasis in the body. But for maintaining an optimal immune system, the scientific evidence suggests that we need to have a higher intake level. And similarly, for vitamin E, zinc, and omega-3, the recommendation had been made for a specific level. Now, um, the recommendation suggested that to, to take a supplementation of multivitamins and minerals on top of well-balanced diet. We also um, want to have our nutrition ideally coming from the well-balanced diet, but it's often very challenging, especially if you try to achieve the recommended level or if you have a decreased um, appetite um, or decreased oral functions to, to process your food, delusion, dysphagia, um, and then other conditions that are often associated with aging. This table shows um, what sort of food in which, how much amount that you need to take in order to fulfill the expert recommendation in the previous slide. Taking an example of 200 milligram vitamin C, you need uh, 1.6 pieces of lemon or almost two pieces of kiwi daily or four pieces of orange, which doesn't sound too bad if you're only trying to do it for a day, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it, it can be um, challenging to, to maintain it and then make it your habit. And then similarly, uh, for vitamin D in a 50 microgram, um, it counts for a 1.2 portion of salmon filet, which doesn't sound bad, but if you go down the list that we're talking about 200 pieces of shiitake mushroom um, or 300 pieces of white bottom mushroom, which can be really challenging, you can fill it up um, by just those mushrooms. And indeed, Dietary intake of vitamin C in Asia Pacific countries are below the recommended levels for, um, for the majority of us. This figure shows that the, the median vitamin C intake among adults in uh, respected Asia Pacific countries. And 100 um, milligram is the, the codex NRVR or the, the codex set the, the nutrition reference value. And then 200 is the expert recommended level. Only Australia exceeds a codex nutrient reference value, but no country is eating enough vitamin C for optimal immune health. 
Similarly for vitamin D, um, which is expressed as a vitamin D status in your blood. And then this map um, indicates that the D vitamin D status among adults and only a few countries in Southeast Asia and in Scandinavia are the sufficient status which suggested a lower risk for the upper respiratory infections. Um, that is set for the 75 nanogram per liter, uh, per liter by an expert recommendation. However, based on, um, depending on your lifestyle and how much sunscreen that you put or these days, how much um, time you spend outdoors, this can fluctuate a lot. And in every country, there is a seasonal change with winter, uh, in the winter that our vitamin D status gets lower. Actually, could I uh, just ask a question? I think uh, it's clear that many of us are not getting the nutrients, but as we get older, is it true also that we absorb even less uh, because of changes to our, our uh, digestive system and, uh, uh, and also, you know, sometimes not eating as much. Uh, have you found that as well? So these are exasperated by yeah. elderly populations. Uh, thanks for pointing that out, Steve. Um, I can fast forward to that point that I uh, was referring to, Rich. Hmm. So for vitamin D, the, there is a two parts that is known to, to sort of attenuate our vitamin D status as we age. The one is the conversion from 7-dehydroxycholesterol uh, to the free vitamin D. So our mm. capacity to converge the precursor of vitamin D to native vitamin D decreases. Also, ah. we spend a couple of um, metabolism inside our body. And then the final conversion is the uh, one hydroxylation and that enzyme um, activity tends to get lower amongst the elderly too. Wow, okay. And that of course, obviously precipitates issues uh, that we might suffer as elderly people. Yeah, okay. detrimental over the course of the years. And yeah. uh, this figure shows, I'm trying to, to minimize the time that I explained this, but you know, give you enough uh, flavor to understand it. Left-hand side shows that how a older population in the Philippines, which are shown in a darker blue, have a higher prevalence of um, inadequate nutrition intake across different nutrition for protein to vitamin B, riboflavin, uh, niacin, etc. So if you see that this uh, darker blue compared to lighter blue, that you have a higher rate of the um, inadequacy. And then this represents that um, women in the Philippines aged between 19 to 49 uh, versus the, those above 50. On the, the right-hand side, we have six countries uh, inadequacy status of vitamin C um, in order of male, female, male, female. So in Indonesia, Philippines, South Korea, Japan, uh, New Zealand, and Australia, Everywhere in, in those six countries that male tend to have a higher rate of uh, inadequacy, suggesting that older male um, tend to be the, the more vulnerable uh, subpopulation in society. And actually there is mm. also studies that suggest that the older male community dwelling and single household are the most vulnerable population for malnutrition when adjusted by the socioeconomic status. Great, thank you. Now, the other part that um, you might have been referring to, Steve, it's, it's about the metabolism, et cetera. So what, what are the biological changes that we need to take into consideration as we age? And then here, there are three nutrients highlighted. So protein, vitamin D, and then B12. Vitamin D, I briefly mentioned that how our metabolism slowed down to, to cascade the intake or conversion of vitamin D to make it an active status. And also because of its role in maintaining a good bone health as well as a muscle health, some countries um, put RDI of vitamin D higher once you hit age 70 or above. So not only that, the, that there's a slowdown in the metabolism of vitamin D to, um, to replenish your body, you also need to have a higher level. 
A similar thing can, can be said about vitamin B12. Um, it needs to be bound to the core transporter and then the binding takes place in acidic condition. So usually when we have a vitamin B12, there's a protein in saliva that is co-swallowed with vitamin B12 and then bound to it in the, in the stomach with a stomach acid. But uh, for as we age, the, the stomach pH goes up, acidity goes down, and then therefore the absorption of vitamin B12 tend to be less efficient. And especially if you're taking antiacidic um, uh, medicines, they, this can be further uh, detrimental. The protein is not, not the least one, but because we tend to go with a slower metabolism as we age, and then we tend to lose muscle mass, we need to have the, um, the protein in order to maintain our physical and functional status. I would also like to, to mention just one thing in, in a specific um, part of the vitamin D. So I mentioned that the vitamin D, we tend to have a slower metabolism in older adults. And also it takes about a couple of months, two, three months in order to elevate the vitamin D status to, to that is optimum through a um, sun exposure or the, the native vitamin D intake. For some nutrients, um, our intakes is in a different form in the metabolism steps. A good example is the how beta carotene is a pre-vitamin A, and you can eat a lot of carrots that can be converted into vitamin A in your body. Vitamin D, as you might have noticed, that has increased its profile recently because of its role in maintaining immune health. And then recent studies shows that the metabolite form of vitamin D called calcidiol is more effective in improving the vitamin D status. Mm -hmm. What we've seen in this figure is that how a, a calcidiol in showing in this darker blue compared to native vitamin D3 in a lighter blue and has a faster and then more efficient profile in elevating the vitamin D status and it can shorten the time um, from 16 weeks to six weeks in this study. And the dosage was about half. Based on the multiple studies that um, look into human um, kinet uh, sorry, pharmacokinetics, the cosphedio is about threefold more efficient than a native vitamin D3, which mm -hmm. can be quite critical for elderly who has you know attenuated metabolism as well as it takes longer time, or it takes long time in general to get that vitamin D status optimal. Okay. Okay. I'm almost uh, finishing my, my slides, but um, I also would like to highlight that the importance of nutritional intervention is recognized by a um, scientific body such as ESPEN, uh, European Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, which published a guideline um, for the nutritional management of COVID-19. And Significant part of it here is that the guideline refers to the need for both patients as well as those at the risk, and including the elderly and uh, those with comorbidity. And then the guideline also highlights the need for micronutrient fortification through supplementation, ONS, or food fortification. This is just to, to recap on that, the expert recommendation. Yeah. But, and this is my slide, last slide, and I hope that the, the, the previous slides and it gave you enough food for thought in how nutrition condition for the elderly can be addressed, especially in the context of immune health. In summary, I'm not going to read all through this, but we need in particular micronutrients and a protein to support the optimal immune functions. The well-balanced diet is the preferred choice, but it's challenging. And supplementation and fortification is a viable option to complement the diet. And it is echoed uh, through the guideline from scientific society. In the bottom text box that is referring to the studies around the quantitative recommendation for the micronutrient. 
But as you might have seen that there are new studies published almost on a daily basis about how some nutrients um, are uh, related to the, the prevalence of COVID-19 or have um, reverse correlations with its status and then the, the um, prevalence of the, the COVID-19. Yeah. There's, however, yet to be the collective summary to make the recommendation in the same fashion to the, the maintenance of healthy immune system as we've seen before. Okay. Great. Good. Tai Chi, uh, we've got we've got a, a question from uh, from our uh, our audience, uh, which is a really a, is there any evidence for nutrients which are good for preventing or curing um, some of the, the the conditions that we might face as we get older, like Alzheimer's or Parkinson or bone health in terms of osteoporosis or uh, prostate. Uh, issues in in uh, the elderly uh, gentlemen. Um, is there is there a growing group of evidence that uh, some of this can be uh, perhaps prevented? Or uh, I don't want to. I hesitate using the word cured. Um, but is there growing evidence in this area? The short answer is yes, and I think historically the focus of the study was more on a dietary patterns. So you might have seen that how Mediterranean diet and some other forms mm -hmm. of diet are healthier in maintaining health throughout the life stages. Yeah. In parallel to those, there are a plethora of studies that I am having a difficult time, which one that I can cite. Um, yes. To, nutrients, um, often combination of nutrients uh, working uh, to, to slow down the, the process of non-communicable disease progression, or sometimes um, either halting or in some rare cases reversing the initial steps that can be measured in the uh, those progression of NCDs. And then those all related to um, the conditions related with them on aging, such as cognitive decline, cardiovascular health, um, ophthalmologic conditions, as well as the, um, the mobility conditions, including, as I mentioned, sarcopenia, which is a lot in muscle mass. Um, what is underlining with this nutritional uh, role, role of nutrition in how to say, uh, preventing the, the rapid progression of the aging is often in the maintenance of the, the normal function as well as um, slowing down the excessive inflammation. Mm -hmm. Okay, as great. Dave, any, uh, any uh, questions from, from you before we, uh, we ask Arakcha to, uh, uh, to share her screen? Yeah, I guess the obvious question is, as Taichi pointed out, we're increasingly seeing many countries hit, you know, large proportions of aging populations. And I guess to this audience and to a lot of audiences, there's a greater awareness of nutrition. But as you start to see it becoming uh, bigger mass aging populations, particularly maybe in the not so developed countries, uh, how does Taichi think that's going to affect uh, a nutrition awareness, um, and, and, and what does that mean in terms of what uh, policymakers and institutions should be doing to try to change some of that institutional nutrition awareness? Yeah, yeah, well, it's a really good point, and, and probably something also that as an industry we should be actively engaging in, not just selling a product, but also selling advice and solutions around the solution that you're offering that can help to, uh, you know, to prevent, uh, which would be a great thing, or to, uh, to work together with, with medicine to uh, have a better out health outcome. Um, so I think uh, it's not just government who has responsibility, it's also industry that has responsibility. Very good. All right, we've got a couple of more questions, but first I think uh, I'd like to, to ask Araksha, maybe Araksha, if you could uh, share your screen. So 
thank you, uh, Tai Chi. Uh, we'll come back to you again with some more questions, but I will um, pass the screen over to Araksha now. Yes, one moment. I will... Absolutely, no problem. Yeah. Great. Yes, there we go. Just needs to be put onto presentation mode and you're away. So, absolutely. So we can... Great, so. There we go. Let's go ahead taking the uh, then the next part after the Daiichi's one. I would like to focus attention on consumer healthcare industry colleagues, which I believe received the same tasks as Lead, actually, uh, how to make a product focusing on immunity, how to deliver products that would help to uh, boost immunity, to support immunity and support health for the elderly people. I believe all of us received this task and uh, some launches happened and some are just waiting for us. But the reality is that, yes, this product category is more and more in focus. And, and that's natural. This is what society needs and people need more products for elderly and, and focused on immunity and overall health. Then let's look how the world has changed. The world definitely changed. Because consumers themselves, uh, COVID-19 lessons learned, they look for products to uh, maintain and boost their immunity. We have, besides the old classics like vitamin C, is the new upcoming hero ingredients mentioned by Daiichi, also some new ones like the prebiotics, probiotics, so microbiome is something new that is now discussed for, for immunity, and also botanicals. And besides, uh, in fact, beside, uh, despite not such a strong science evidence behind, which we have at the same time for vitamins, botanicals are becoming more and more popular. So in the end for immunity, people look for nutritional solutions. That's the fact. I mean, let's look how lesson was learned from the medical society. AG already showed us. The most important thing for the doctors lessons learned is that Guys, we have the population of people which are here, elderly comorbid. It's the first and first recommendation from Aspen. Check elderly comorbid for the malnutrition. Why? Because this is what saves their lives as soon as they appear at hospital. In fact, we talk not only about COVID. COVID is an example. It's any hospital. That's just a very fair example of condition that rapidly takes you into the hospital halls. For, for especially for elderly people, that can be anything, heart attack, any other hospitalization, even accidents. So you, you need to be ready with your inner hygiene. And this mm -hmm. patient elderly comorbid is in focus. Why? That's a raising population. I mean, we know elderly, the number of elderly people grows and the number of disease grows. As, as, as a result, we have the population who are older and who have one, two or three uh, disease at the same time. So now when we develop product for these people who are, let's say 65 plus and who have one or more disease, need to answer the question, so whom do we treat? That this is the most difficult questions, you know? Oh. Do you have an answer? Me not, because this is not a person who is old plus diabetes, that can be person who has diabetes plus hypertension, plus neuropathy, plus, or, or one of them. In fact, 80% of people above 65, they have one disease already. 68% of them have two disease or more. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's an alerting number, but this is our reality. So what we treat is failed immune responses. As Taichi told, actually what we treat is malnutrition because that is the friend, the partner that comes with the age. So just a bit of the mathematics, the numbers. Look here, among people who were hospitalized, generally with any reasons, if you are, your age is 70 plus, then uh, you are at very high risk to have a malnutrition. In fact, among hospitalized patients, look at the numbers, 40% are 
uh, have the just malnutrition and 20% have severe malnutrition. So 60% of people who are hospitalized, they have this issue. And of course, malnutrition is something that needs to be managed, not in the hospital holes, walls only. It's, it, it, it needs to be done before and after. So yeah. This question came from you, Steve, and yeah, Taichi also touched point here. I mean, why we get malnourished? Yes, one of the reasons is that the people of elderly age, they eat less. The first reason, there is always the egg and chicken point here. Mm -hmm. An example, with the hormonal change, there is a muscle loss, muscle mass uh, loss, then it's less movement, then it equals less energy consumption, then it equals less demand in food. And then you have the anorexia of elderly age. From the other front, yes, nutrients, not only nutrients, drugs. Our colleagues in uh, pharma know it very well. Elderly people absorb any nutrient or drug less than, than uh, people of uh, the middle ages or the youngsters. And from the other front also, there is such a thing as disease-related malnutrition, because if you have disease, you have definitely more demand in energy, in nutraceuticals, and overall, all together, they bring into this condition. So we mm. all malnutrition as a basis. We call it an immune boost, or even as you told, for other conditions as well. And yeah, the story starts before. So for us as an industry, I consider one of the biggest purposes for which I work is exactly to, to raise awareness about importance to keep this inner hygiene far before you are in hospital. That is important. This is your guarding jacket that protects you in, in any occasion, no matter COVID or anything. But it never stops. Treatment doesn't stop in the hospital. It needs to be continued, especially for elderly people. Recovery is crucial. So that's one front before and after the hospital. And yeah, colleagues from consumer care, healthcare industry, this is our front of the battle. Hospital is the front of the RX Pharma guys, but uh, for us, before and after, this is our responsibility to teach, raise awareness, and help these people to keep their health on the good state. So then coming back here, so from the right side, you see it needs to be done after and uh, be the hospital and before. So on the right side, you see the hero ingredients also outlined by Daichi. In fact, uh, so as I tell, it's not a question of one week or two weeks, but personally for me, the wow point of 2020 lesson learned from COVID was vitamin D. That's mm. We, first of all, we see so many publications dated 2020, incredible number, but the remarkable one also Daichi Taich point on calcifediol. So it came out in September, in the middle of September, and just a simple mathematics. So that's a Spanish study. If you Google up calcifediol COVID, this is the first thing that comes up in the Google and it's open access. I really recommend colleagues in, uh, in OTC industry also to take a look at this article. I mean, simple mathematics. So patients were, um, who came to the hospital with COVID, they were split into two groups and one received calcifediol, the other one did not. So among 50 patients who received calcifediol, only one patient was then uh, transferred into intensive care unit. In the group without calcifediol, 13 out of 26 appeared in intensive care units. When, of course, this article as any science publication in the end, you see this phrase that more studies needs to be done. Yeah, more studies needs to be done. That's the uh, task for the science world. But for me, as the industry representative, it means that go ahead and make the product for people. Fifth. Yeah. Among 50 people, one in ICU, among 26, 13 in ICU. So it means that, yes, we need to bring up this more fast vitamin D just to the consumer yeah. immediately. That's an all but this is, But uh, Araksha, this is one of the frustrating things I find, that uh, there is so much great proof on vitamin D, yet it's never enough for 
uh, uh, many, and there was a recent case in the, in the UK where uh, uh, there was an initiative to, to uh, basically have the government support the use of vitamin D as a preventative for, um, uh, for uh, increased, uh, well, as a prevention from COVID, but increasing immunity. And um, it, was, it was killed effectively, even at the highest levels of government, there was this almost lack of common sense in terms of adopting something which is relatively inexpensive, but yet has shown to have great proof. What do we need to do to convince uh, medical authorities and governments to adopt um, this kind of uh, thing? I think, yeah, that's that's a very good point, Steve. Unfortunately, that's reality. And, you know, many years ago when I started to work in uh, TC industry and uh, promoting vitamins, so 15 years ago as a med rep, when I visited doctors, it was always a kind of, yeah, in, in Arik's world, okay, these are just vitamins, they are good for health. But the problem is... Uh, the lack of promotion awareness among medical world, first of all. Secondly, we need to work with authorities, not only show this health benefits, it's pharmacoeconomics plays an important role here. When you work, they always win. That's exactly, that's affordable solution and solution that works really well. And we need to be specific. I think we as industry, we need to be specific. We should not say just vitamins. We should say yes. D in this patient population, in this setup, and what yeah. are the effects? And yeah. Yeah, I am optimistic. I am optimistic. Yes. Not only us, uh, I know uh, from industry, uh, that's the yeah. human front that works on it. So yeah. this it is changing. It is changing. It is so changing. Carry on, please. Yeah. So it is I, changing. I, I, if, if I can just come in there, you know, it's sort of interesting what you're raising. and. I find it interesting that, yes, we're talking about the industry is slow, uh, but I also find the industry, governments, again, go back to, in the countries I look at a lot, Japan, uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, uh, across Asia, when it comes to the Asian population, the education on a simple thing like that uh, is very, very poor. Um, so unless people actually go to a doctor with a specific problem, um, or in some cases, they go to a pharmacist and raise a specific problem. It's very difficult for them to actually know this, right? Um, it's not widely uh, publicized, I guess. Uh, and more importantly, I always find it very interesting. Public health institutions, and more importantly, as we talk about people entering retirement, um, the information doesn't come. So, and I'll give you a simple example. I'm sitting here in Sydney. I have a, what's called a seniors card. So it's a, uh, it's, it's basically a benefits card. So you get cheap transport and all those sorts of things. Now it offers me uh, deals on buying wine, uh, crates of wine cheaply. <laughs> um, but I notice, I, I've noticed that it never offers me, it, it never offers me deals on getting vitamin E, um, for example, or any vitamins or any supplements, right? Uh, or even giving me advice on you know, uh, a better balanced diet or the things that I need to, to top up because, as you say, uh, not me personally because I eat like a hog, but uh, lots of people entering their 60s and 70s, of course, cut back on how much they eat and they start to not think about it so much. Yeah, that's a very good point, Dave. So that's uh, and a very good food for the industry to think about these directions, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So just wanted to make a point uh, to thank uh, the audience for sending in the questions. We will try and, and answer them uh, during the uh, session. But if we can't, be assured that all of your questions that you send in during the session and before the session, we will get them back to you with a recording of this uh, webinar. So none of your questions will remain unanswered. Uh, so please keep sending in your questions, we will do our best. Right, Araksha, carry on, we've disturbed uh, your flow. So where we stand, so we know who we treat, we know when we treat before and after, and we know with what we treat, so what needs to be inside the product, so how we do that. That's, uh, that was a representation, in fact, about vitamin D. Uh, wanted to say that, look, 
we, we are repeating the same thing that was done during the Spanish flu. I mean, yeah. this vitamin D treatment 100 years ago. Now we have the pills. So in any case, let's move ahead. Huh? So let's think, how do we get these products to elderly people? First of all, never assume that other people make choices for elderly. Wow. These times are gone. So as you told, Steve, these are consumers who are not only inspired, care about their health, they are also empowered. They, they use the digital channels very well, not only for purchase, but also to get an insight. So they look for information. We need to take it to account. And we need to make it fun for them. Indeed, because remember, I mean, among the seven people here, I told statistics. So uh, six of them have one disease and five of them has two diseases. Hmm. Already take tablets. Do they want another tablet? Probably necessary, yes, but we need to try to reduce this number of tablets and provide solution that will be integrated into their lifestyle. So what they look for, very simple three things. They want to have a good memory, bright mind, mobility, and good immunity. And in fact, again, the importance of proteins, uh, this muscle mass loss, something that elderly feel, this is what they feel. They don't feel this deficiency of vitamins, probably, tangibly, it's just there, but they don't feel it, but they feel that they need more muscle power. I need to provide more products with protein. The answer is very simple. And actually, when you think product for elderly, it needs to have proteins and amino acids. And also, once again, they also look for botanicals. So now let's see, this is our exercise we did in 2019. We went to elderly home and asked, I mean, what are their food habits? I mean, indeed, a lot of people say that they cannot eat so much. They sometimes keep one of the foods and they just really want to eat healthy. But first of all, they want to eat tasty. They want to yeah. eat steak and pizza, such kind of things. But imagine from the list of Daiichi, how much of each healthier food you need to eat to get this nutraceutical scene. And this is, in fact, also important for the protein intake. I mean, in, in industry, we tend to think that once a day, it's, it's really good. Yeah, it's good. But when you talk about protein, and the amount of proteins that you want to insert into once a day uh, shake, sometimes it means for elderly that I cannot eat anything else anymore. And then as a result, uh -huh. three times it is taken and they say, come on guys, I want to eat my pizza. So we need to decrease the volume of the shakes and we need to think how to distribute along the day to make it really fun. Yeah, in Europe, like we, uh, th there are a lot of cool startups that exactly uh, provide healthy and very tasty food. But this is more specialized, I would say. This is for people, for example, who have the chewing problem, the stroke survivors, who some constituents. For mm -hmm. one from the right, it's, it's such a nice example of how to keep people hydrated, but they really have a problem with memory. That's the problem. They forget to drink the water. And this uh, just jellies, uh, <coughs> the elderly has a task to finish the box during the day. But still, should we land up in peels? I believe no, we have a chance to do it much fun. I mean, look here, if this is just an example, we need to integrate those solutions into the daily life. So mm. if, if the protein intake is divided into several times, in the morning, a part of the vitamin, mineral, and proteins goes into the muesli, which is not fillable, which has no taste. And in fact, I really recommend for product development for elderly, try to go into fortifiers, which have no taste, because elderly really want to eat the food that they know that they like the taste. So don't disturb the taste when you make the fortifier. Mm. And then great, great, great point. example of... Great point. Sorry, Dave. That's yeah, a yeah, really I'm good so. point. Uh, uh, did some work in Japan a few years ago, uh, and we found exactly this point. That you've got to make sure that you just let them eat what they want to eat. Yes. And then put the stuff into that rather than try to recreate it with false flavors. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's points that works, really. It's not about, I have a product which contains everything, which is once a day, they need to take it and they are elderly, they want to enjoy the taste. 
I mean, this is one of example how solution would look like. And uh, imagine together with all those things, there are pills still for hypertension, for diabetes, for other disease. So these people also integrated into each food intake. But yeah, the message is that be creative and uh, remember, so this elderly people of, of the coming generation, they really want to enjoy life. They are active yeah. and fun and yeah. And we'll finish my uh, presentation with, we, we usually advise what we do ourselves. I mean, we <laughs> advise is from the elderly people. They want to enjoy life, be more active. They want to work hard. We, we learned it during the previous pre webinar also, and they want to be just happy, eat, drink, be healthy. Very good. That's a beautiful chart uh, to finish. I think uh, it's like, we mustn't think of elderly as, you know, something which is very negative. I think it's such a positive experience. And we were talking in the last webinar about new life builders. It's actually very motivating and inspiring to be living every day and creating something new. And I think some of these are, are fantastic. Thank you, Araksha. Let's stay with this slide for the moment. And uh, uh, Dave, any questions for Araksha um, Taichi? Yeah, one, one question, and it relates back to uh, the last session we had, again, about retirement. Um, and so as people around the world, wherever the retirement vague age is, somewhere around the mid-60s going up to the early 70s these days, um, in terms of the nutrition and in terms of being able to... Um, what the, the, Obviously, it's a big change of life. There's that point in life where you stop working or you think about stop working and what am I going to do for the next 10, 20, 30 years of your life? Uh, what do you see in, in the way in which uh, nutrition is a part of pre preparing and also coping with that change? Yeah, that's, that's a brilliant question. I mean, as, as we told, that's basically nutrition will... Yeah, for, for elderly people, that's that's an important medicine. Huh? They, they need to take care about that. They need to uh, cope with that and to combine a good, good food with, with the nutraceuticals that are needed from, from several. From yeah, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering about stress, right? So it is a very stressful period where people are thinking about retiring and then in different work I've done, you know, that first two years after retirement is extremely stressful because it's a point of, hey, what am I going to do? How do I do? How do I fill in the day? Maybe there's income issues, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering if, you know, you've got any comments about the way in which nutrition can help people as they're going through stress, you know, they, how do they, how does nutrition help them with that? Yeah, let me pick up this question as well. Uh, first, starting, I mean, yeah, eating with fun and enjoy, this is one thing, but we know well, yeah, with Daiichi that are certain nutraceuticals and the huge science behind that. What we call uh, in publications, you will find it in anxiety, even depression, even there are publications that show how you combine with the anxiety drug certain nutraceuticals and it has an effect. Yeah. Some examples, of course, very well known, omega-3 fatty acids, mm. EHA and EPA. Yeah. Love yeah, yeah. Find. So good mood, anxiety. There is some evidence that uh, shows that those are very important. Also, um, probably one of my favorite vitamins, it's the B6, pyridoxine. Yeah. That's directly connected with our response to the stress. Pyridoxine is basically the bridge that each time you are stressed, you have high glutamate level. The task of the B6 is to turn it into GABA, which makes you relaxed and happy. And in, in fact, also uh, quite the amount of pyridoxine also present in our gut. And this is one of, one of also uh, the points that we emphasize when we talk about gut brain access. So there are some, if, if to summarize, so omegas, B6, I would also point out the same vitamin D, 
there, there are some publications around that. And actually, uh, remember always how sunshine affects your mood. I also like to echo uh, on what Araksha said, and then maybe to, to give another angle to it, the other B vitamins like thiamines, riboflavins, especially those are related to the um, metabolism, like energy related metabolism that, you know, e even if you take enough amount of carbohydrates, proteins, or those caloric intakes that uh, this, when lacking those uh, cofactors in converting them and digesting them, you can feel lethargic. So that, that's another element of, I guess, the, the healthy mood and maintaining a, a good um, mood health um, in addition to looking mm -hmm. into uh, the anxiety and the mood related with uh, nutritional status such as omega-3. I, I, I don't imagine that applies even more so this year because of uh, lockdowns, lock-ins, and, and people having to cope with that as well, right? So Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I, one more, I know we're we're over time, but uh, I just want one question, which I think is an interesting one from the audience, which is um, there's been a lot of uh, excitement and growth in this area of probiotics and prebiotics. Um, you mentioned it before, Araksha, um, that it can support. Can you give a little bit more information about it, how, how probiotics can really improve um, this uh, uptake or nutrition in uh, the aging population. Mm -hmm. I suggest I, I start and Taichi can continue because I know he has super good insights with regards to science. No, quite simply, our gut health, the microbial diversity, it's connected to overall health status, first of all. And second, there are a lot of processes connected with microbiome. I mean, what we have a lot in the science, it's just yeah. it's connected to different disease onset. Very simple with nutrition and malnutrition. Uh, it's e even the malabsorption can be fixed with a healthier microbiome. And okay. remember, especially in elderly, they take a lot of drugs. You know, certain drug classes like NSAIDs, painkillers, PPI inhibitors, they bring dysbiosis. And then it has its long chain domino effects. So. Mm. This mm. treatment this is probably one of most important when, when we do any nutritional treatment anyways, but I also leave the space for Taichi to comment also. Yeah, Taichi, please. Pick up on, you know, uh, where Haraksha commented. Um, obviously, the microbiome plays a very important role. And then the majority of immune cells are actually uh, located in our digestive system. And you might consider that our body is, is a tube. You know, we have our skin and outer, uh, an outer part of the tube and then digestive organs in the inside of the tube. And that the inside of the tube is, is really concentrated with um, immune cells as well as this is where we interface the most with the microbiome, uh, which numbers of cells is 10 times more than our own. The, perhaps the age-related uh, dysbiosis can be highlighted in the oral cavity, for example, that you know that we tend to have a more gingivitis as we age, and mm. it's, a, it's a dysbiosis between a certain bacteria like Porphyromonas that evades our immune um, system like TLR, and in a very simple term, they, they learn that if they kick you and you bleed, and so that they get more nutrients coming in. And then that vicious cycle can um, really shift that the homeostasis from a healthy and imbalanced um, symbiosis with the commensal bacteria yeah. to organic ones. And this is where that pro and then prebiotics can restore those balances, especially in the stage where it's still a reversible. Very good. Very, yeah. Very, I think there's there's something wonderful in that, and there's still lots and lots to learn, but the evidence is really growing um, that uh, this could be something very, very positive in, in prevention and, yeah, dare I say it, sometimes in restoring a balance, restoring the body back to uh, health. So um, very much. Okay. Well, we're over time, and... Uh, 
Um, I wanted to just on behalf of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy say a big thank you to both of you, Tai Chi and Araksha, and of course to you, Dave, and uh, um, really encourage all of you who are listening, um, you know, to ask ourselves how we can how we can help to restore that uh, and inspire that inner hygiene. I love that uh, phrase because it's that inner hygiene that really makes such a difference to our health and wellness and improves our health outcomes, whether we're looking for wellness or whether we're looking to return to health and wellness. And I think there is something very exciting we can do as an industry of uh, consumer healthcare uh, in supporting our patients for that. So thank you very much. And um, so I'd like to hand uh, back to AIM and Sheila um, to uh, just uh, sign us off and to uh, uh, talk about something else that's coming in the next uh, month, which is very exciting. Uh, thank you, Steve. And thank you, all of you. Thank you, Alakcha, Taiji, and Dave for a really great session. But before we part today, we would like to invite you again to our next webinar on December the 2nd under the topic of Water, Water, Not Enough Everywhere by Dr. Randall M. Shannon a PhD associate professor, program director of marketing, co-director of international program at Mahidon University College of Management. Dr. Randall specializes in cross-cultural consumer behavior, market research and sustainability. So you may wonder how is water related to consumer healthcare? So this webinar will look at some of the issues arising of the world's water shortage, how our time during COVID have highlighted what health and wellness marketers will need to do in thinking about having a water policy in the future. And at the end of this event, you will receive an invitation to register to join us. Before we go on behalf of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy team, we would like to say big thank you to Alaksha, Taiji, our speakers together with Dev and Steve for making this session really fantastic and practical. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We wish you a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, and we hope to see you again in December. Thank you. Bye.